So let's look at our first Byron poem, which is Loch Nagar. Um, I've given you a, a picture on the slide there just of Loch Nagar. It's, you know, dark and desolate and fabulous, um, just as a, as a landscape. Um, and then if you if you get the poem up before you, there's it's it's on the slides here on, on the next one after after the pictures of the mountain there. Um, and I want you to think as you're reading this, how does this compare with the nature, the the vistas, the landscape views that we've we've seen in um, in Wordsworth and Coleridge? Um, what is Byron saying with the landscape? And this is very much a politicized landscape. If we, if we look at just the, the opening line, um, we start not with the celebration, but with a rejection of what the landscape is not. So we, we open with, away ye gay landscapes, ye gardens of roses, and you let the minions of luxury go rove. So there's, um, you know, the English garden here is set up the gay landscape, so the, you know, the the pretty landscape, what is nice and what is tame, uh, the gardens of roses, that's where, well, the minions of luxury, that, that is where kind of the, the servants of, um, of wealth and comfort, like, okay, there, there are these people who live comfortably, they can go and walk nicely through the, these tamed landscapes, um, that is not what what Byron is is longing for here. So in, in that sense, I think um, a very familiar romantic notion. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and at once um, Byron says, "Okay, re restore me the rocks where the snowflake reposes, if still they are sacred to freedom and love." Um, so he says, "I I want to be I want the rocky." Um, the rocky uh, landscapes, the savage, you know, the cold, the snowflake. You know, this is this is um, the wild, a, a wilder scenery than these pleasant, tamed gardens of roses. Um, I mean, the the elements are warring here, and this is something we'll we'll see in uh, you know in, in in Shelley has some fantastic lines about the kind of these violent elements. Um, so the, the elements are, are warring, the elements are fighting, the cataracts foam set of smooth flowing fountains. Um, I sigh for the valley of Dark Loch Nagar. And that brings in an interesting point from Byron, that Byron is often talking from a point of exile, from a point of longing. It's not a here I am, I'm happy, I'm, I'm rooted in this place. It is romanticised in... <laughs> How many different version interpretations of the word romantic are there? Um, it's it's romanticized in a kind of this is a in a way that people often romanticize idyllic landscapes. You know, we, we're used to the pastoral. Um, this is a a longing for the wild and tumultuous, and he links it very much to his childhood, which I'm, I'm sure you've kind of been discussing the the romantic myth of childhood when you're looking at Blake and people like that. But this kind of idyllic time when we were wiser and happier and we didn't have the weight of the world on us um going back to rousseau's famous quote you know man is born free but he is everywhere in chains um this is this is the liberty of the child and, and for byron it's a it's a liberty that is very much connected with nature he's he's living here amongst um uh, amongst the pine covered glade um, he's, he lives outdoors all day, you know, I sought not my home till the day's dying glory. It's just that he, he is just essentially, you know, a, a wild child. He's thrown outdoors, right, go, play. Um, which is the way I think most children are brought up in the countryside, is just chuck them out of doors. Certainly was, that was my upbringing, just put her out, off you go, look after yourself. Um. And, and you know, he, he he does connect himself with the the kind of the Scottish um, the Scottish traits here. My cap was the bonnet, my coat was the plaid. Uh, so the kind of the traditional um, you know Scottish bonnet and plaid being like a like a tartan. Um, but it's not just him. It's not just his present. It's not just his immediate past. Um, it is politicized in that it is talking of the um, the very difficult history of 
um, of the Highlanders, um, which uh, I'm sure, well, imagine, imagine you kind of have some knowledge of, but essentially uh, it was the English, as always, uh, coming in and uh, basically saying that the, you know, colonizing the, the Scottish, um, the Scottish Highlands, forbidding uh, the, the wearing of tartan and the speaking of Gaelic. And, um, you know, he, you know, absolute tragic, uh, you know, murders and, and, and real, real violence done, um, which is, uh, I think, you know, still remembered to, um, in, in Scotland today, but is, is much closer for, for Byron. Now, Byron isn't exactly the, the, the poor families living, you know, who, who were, um, brutally ejected in, in the Highland clearances, but he's, he's not far from it. Um, and he, he talks here of the dead, so shades of the dead, have I not heard your voices rise on the night rolling breath of the gale? Surely the soul of the hero rejoices and rides on the wind or his own highland vale. Round Loch Nagar, where the stormy mist gathers, winter presides in his cold icy car. Clouds there encircle the forms of my fathers. They dwell in the tempests of dark Loch Nagar. So here the, the landscape is very specifically connected to the past, to the ghosts of the past, and the ghosts are actually part of nature here and that they are they are living in the tempests um, so this isn't just let's just go and look at a mountain and it's going to feel nice this is connected with a kind of a childhood innocence it is connected with a cultural history and yeah we, we go into you know the next stanza here you'll see there's a little bit more information about um about the history, those who died at Culloden, uh, not crowned uh, with victory, they they weren't celebrated in in their um, in their deaths. But finally, the the last stanza returns to our speaker, to I, and the the I as speaker is a really, a really difficult thing with Byron because I mean in in any poem we look at the speaker and say well the speaker isn't necessarily the persona of the poet. Um, it isn't necessarily the, the poet themselves, uh, but we really have a Byronic narrator here. And I'm going to use this word Byronic because I don't... It is presented as being Byron. Most of his poems, you know, the vast majority of them are, have a Byronic narrator. And sometimes that Byronic, Byronic narrator slips into the poem. And that's all kinds of complicated. <laughs> uh, but um, I think the main thing to remember with Byron's writer is remember it's always performed. Remember he's always thinking of his audience. Uh, e even the kind of the painting of himself with, with the hat and plaid, um, the bonnet and plaid is like, well, why why do that if this is just about his own remembrances? It's obviously not. He's, he's got an audience in mind. He's saying, oh, this was me. This is what I'm, this is my culture. This is my background. This is where I'm coming from. And so this last stanza comes into this kind of nostalgia. Years have rolled on Loch Nagar since I left you. Years must elapse ere I see you again. Nature of verdure and flowers has bereft you, yet still thou art dearer than Albion's plain. Uh, so Albion being England, so he's just kind of saying, yes, I've, I've been gone a long time. Um, and as I said, Byron is a poet who lives in exile. Here he's kind of seeing England as an exile from Scotland. Uh, but he will, he, he spends most of his life in, in England and he certainly sort of presents himself as English, uh, particularly later, uh, later in his life, but then, with the kind of um, you know, he he leaves England, never to come back, for, you know, for, and he dies. Uh, you know, do, does a lot of travelling through through kind of Switzerland and Italy. Um, you know, spends a significant part of the the last years of his life in in Italy and then and then in Greece, um, and there was a sense, and we get that in. in in his later poems of, of an exile from from his homeland, which has kind of become England at this point. So there's a romanticism for what he can't have. Uh, and again, just that, that final dig at England, we return to the start of the poem, essentially. England, thy beauties are tame and domestic to one who has roved on the mountains afar. Oh, for the crags that are wild and majestic, the steep frowning glories of dark Loch Nagar. Um, England, okay, yes, it is beautiful, it does have beauties, uh, but those are 
tame, they're restrained, they're quiet, they're domestic, they're simple and fine, and that's great and everything. But for those of us who have known the magnificent mountains, Byron says, it's nothing. It's it's nothing at all. Uh, so a celebration of the kind of the the dark, the craggy, the rough, the un untamed. Um, so we'll we're gonna that I think leads us very nicely into darkness. <laughs> Literally into darkness. Um, the poem darkness is coming up next.